um, with a, it's found under the closed caption um, symbol. So again, we are very happy to welcome our seminar series speaker today, Dr. Aya Osman. Um, and in these seminar series, we plan to um, feature neuroscience faculty, neurologists, postdocs, and graduate students. And we're hoping to provide a stage for them to share their science and their paths to neuroscience um, throughout their um, lives overall. And we hope that this will help um, create a, a broader impact on how our community views um, and identifies neuroscientists. So for just for some logistical points, um, I will give her talk. It'll be about 40 minutes. And at the end, um, we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes um, for questions. So throughout the talk, you can feel free to put your questions um, in the question and an answer function, and I will address those questions at the end of her talk. So now to introduce Aya, Dr. Aya Osmond is a postdoctoral fellow who joined the Seaver Autism Center and the Friedman Brain Institute at the Icon School of Medicine in 2018. Her postdoctoral research um, is focused on the gut-brain axis and its involvement in gene by environment interactions in genetic mouse models of autism spectrum disorder. For this work, she is awarded the autism, the Seaver Autism Center Postdoctoral Fellowship, and recently the Brain and Behavioral Research Foundation Young Investigator Grant. Prior to embarking on her postdoctoral work, Dr. Aya Osman was awarded the Biotechnological and Biological Sciences doctoral training studentship and completed her PhD in neuropharmacology at the University of Surrey at, and in, 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 sorry, excuse me, and at the Imperial College of London in the UK. So without further ado, we would like to welcome Dr. Aya Osman. Thank you, Ashley, for that wonderful introduction. Can you all hear me? Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much to the organizers of Black and Neuro for their invite to give a talk at this wonderful and prestigious platform. Um, also, thank you to the attendees uh, for tuning in, despite the little hiccups this morning, um, this afternoon even, to hear me rant for the next, uh, for the best part of the next 40 to 45 minutes. Um, as mentioned, my name is Aya Osman, and I'm currently a postdoc at the Icon School of Medicine. And today, I really wanted my talk to serve two key purposes. I wanted to share some of the exciting science that I've been doing focused on elucidating mechanisms which convey crosstalk or communication between the trillions of bacteria found in our gut and the brain. Um, I also hope to share some glimpses into the journey and steps I took to get me to this particular research focus and how modeling fashion and the beauty industry fits into it all. So for a brief outline, so we can keep this talk somewhat organized and chronological, uh, I'm going to start with providing a bit of background to where I'm from, both geographically, as well as background to some of the research questions I will talk about today. I'll then move on to talk about some of the key findings from my PhD related to early life dietary influences on brain development and subsequent behavior. And then I'll end with some glimpses into my current ongoing research into the connection between the gut and the brain in uh, autism spectrum disorders. Before I delve into the next few slides, I wanted to give full credit to Ben Hung at Well Cornell, for, uh, who used these slides as an introduction to one of my talks at their seminar series. And I just thought it was such a uh, wonderful way to introduce speakers and have quote unquote, um, borrowed these slides ever since. So my place of origin is Sudan, a country in Northern Africa shown here on the map just below Egypt. And here are some of its um, uh, images of its capital Khartoum located where the blue and white uh, Nile meet. And above that, we have an image of some of Sudan's rich history uh, this image here is from a region called Marawi, which I believe used to be the capital of the Kush Empire. But I actually uh, never lived in Sudan. My parents migrated to a nearby country in the Middle East called Saudi Arabia. Uh, they moved to a city called Jeddah, found by the Red Sea, just here. 
um, which is actually the second largest city after its capital, Riyadh, uh, and the second largest seaport, um, as well as being the commercial center of Saudi Arabia. And it was here in Jeddah that I was born and spent the first few years of my childhood. We then migrated once again, you know, as you do, <laughs> and this time to what will become my more permanent home, London in the United Kingdom. And this is really where I spent my formative years, as well as the earlier stages of my scientific career. In the UK, I went through the pretty standard um, academic route with some twists and turns here and there. I completed an undergraduate degree um, in biomedical science at a campus, which may or may not look like Hogwarts to some of you. Um, I then completed an MSc in toxicology at Surrey University, shown here. And it was really during my MSc that my interest in the neurobiology underlying behavior really began to manifest. The MSc introduced me to Dr. Alexis Bailey and Dr. Ian Kitchen, who would later become my PhD supervisors. And under their supervision during my MSc, I carried out a three month research project investigating subtypes of a type of receptor found in the brain called glutamate receptors and how these glutamate receptors interact in cocaine addiction. Uh, now, prior to embarking on the PhD route, I worked briefly as a desk-based toxicologist uh, and contributed uh, to the publication of two public health guidance documents related to health effects of chemicals. And this experience at Public Health England um, allowed me to gain insights into the wider applications of scientific research, particularly how scientific research can be taken from the bench and translated into policy and public health guidelines. Um, and these are really lessons that I've kept with me throughout my scientific career, you know, kind of keeping in mind the end goal of your re uh, research and your findings. Now, while I was starting to gain experience into how we use animal models to study human conditions or using mathematical models to better understand complex ne networks, I also got involved in a different style of modeling, and that is fashion modeling. This is an image close to my heart from one of my favorite annual uh, fashion shows in London called Africa Fashion Week, which runs during the annual London Fashion Week and essentially brings together designers from across the continent of Africa and gives them a platform to showcase their work. And throughout my talk today, I will stop to highlight how activities from this seemingly alternate career have served to strengthen aspects of my scientific training. Now, moving on uh, to discuss how I got into researching the connection between the gut and the brain, called the gut-brain axis, as well as some of the science behind this connection. In 2013, I returned to Dr. Bailey's lab to carry out a PhD project in collaborat collaboration with Dr. Jonathan Swan at Imperial College London. And my PhD research questions stemmed from original work by Ian Kitchen and co. back in the early 1990s. And they were using a phenomenon called stress-induced analgesia, or SIA, to study the temporal development of opioid receptors in the brain. And SIA is essentially a biological protection mechanism by which pain is suppressed during or after pain in humans and animals. And it involves the release of endogenous opioids or opioids made by our body. Now, using a pharmacolog pharmacological approach, uh, Kitchen et al. found that SIA is mediated by new opioid receptors up until postnatal day 20, and then by postnatal day 25, um, SIA switches to being mediated by delta opioid receptors. And what they had found was that the switch from mu to delta mediated SIA only happens when rats are weaned from their mothers on postnatal day 21. What they found, Alibi accidentally at first, because a technician forgot to wean the pups on postnatal day 21, was that if you don't wean normally at that age, uh, this switch from mu to delta doesn't occur. These observations triggered a series of long and elegant studies aimed at figuring out uh, what it is about delayed weaning that can disrupt normal de development of opioid receptors in the brain. And in 2001, they were able to pin down that it wasn't any maternal factors responsible for this, um, but it was actually prolonged consumption of maternal milk beyond weaning age, and in particular, per, uh, prolonged consumption or exposure to a protein found in milk called casein that was causing this dysregulation to um, opioid receptors. And it's not just the opioid receptor undergoing uh, development in early postnatal life, the brain as a whole undergoes rapid growth and development during the first two to five years of life. 
uh, in humans, which translates roughly into the first few weeks of life in rodents. And this period is characterized by several um, uh, features or processes shown here, such as synaptogenesis, synaptic pruning, and myelination of neurons. Now, not only do these developmental changes in early life underpin how we go on to feel, speak, move, and socialize, but importantly, for both my PhD and subsequent postdoc work, we know that these early life uh, changes are also sensitive to both genetic and environmental influences. Now, in parallel to all of this going on in the brain, um, the resident bacteria of the gastrointestinal tract, collectively known as the gut microbiome, which begin to colonize our gut at birth, um, show a similar dynamic developmental trajectory to that seen in the brain. And this is depicted down here on this graph adapted from uh, Roswell et al, showing that the developmental trajectory of the most abundant bacterial taxa found in the gut across the first, first five years of life uh, fluctuates. So um, over the last 10 years, showings that uh, we, ha we have data showing that the gut microbiome or signals from the gut microbiome contribute to normal brain and development. Um, and we also know, sorry, I don't know why these are uh, uh, moving, but we also know that the uh, developmental trajectory of the microbiome in early life is also influenced by early life um, factors such as mode of birth um, and even dietary factors such as breast milk or formula milk. Now, while the exact mechanisms by which the gut and the brain um, communicate to mediate behavior are not completely understood, my research to date has really focused on trying to elucidate some of these mechanisms. And we know that there are several potential routes by which the gut and the brain signal to each other, including signaling through the vagus nerve, the immune system via circulating cytokines, and in particular interest to my, uh, of particular interest to my own research, is the release of metabolites by gut bacteria that can enter circulation and influence the host's own peripheral as well as central metabolic profile, as we will see shortly. And some metabolites like short chain fatty acids, which I'll talk about later, um, can even enter the brain and influence behavior directly. Now, given the role of the opioid system in mood regulation, in my PhD, I set out to assess if the casein-induced dysregulation to opioid receptors translates into alterations in mood. And I was able to show that rats provided with milk containing casein for five extra days beyond weaning displayed increased immobility in the four swim test compared to animals given milk lacking casein with total protein uh, made up using soy and animals just weaned normally on day 21 and provided with no milk afterwards. Uh, and, you know, it's controversial, but reduced immobility in the four swim test can be used as a proxy for depressive like uh, behavior. And so this really indicates that exposure to casein beyond the standard age of weaning can result in increased depressive like behavior. And now these, these changes in behavior were also in line with changes in reduced density of mu opioid receptors in the deep layer of the somatosensory cortex. And this is shown here in this representative autoradiogram where we see uh, in case in rich animals, the deep layer of the somatosensory cortex does show lower uh, mu opioid receptor density compared to both case in free and control animals. Um, as well as the, this uh, you know, down regulation in delta opioid receptors, we did also uh, look at oxytocin receptors because we know the oxytocin system plays an important role uh, in mood regulation too. And here we also found a down regulation in mu opioid receptors in the basal lateral amygdala. And this is apparent here when you look at the slices from case in rich animals, they do show lower binding of oxytocin um, OVTA um, in the B BLA compared compared to both case and free and control animals. What's more, we also found that animals provided with casein for five extra days beyond weaning uh, displayed an increase in a bacterial group called Clostridium um, histolyticum in the cecum and the colon compared to case and free counterparts. Now, with the help of a uh, PhD student in Jonathan Swan's lab called Simone Zuffa, uh, we were able to show that prolonged consumption of casein 
also results in alterations to the urinary metabolic profile. And this was seen in the form of ex increased excretion of hippurate when you look at casein-rich animals compared to casein-free. And this uh, increase in hippurate excretion is also seen in casein-rich animals compared to um, controls. Now, hippurate is a gut microbial mammalian co-metabolite released when gut bacteria break down plant phenols. And as hippurate is formed when benzoate is conjugated with glycine, and indeed we see that casein-rich animals show a decrease in glycine um, com when compared to casein-free counterparts, um, it indicates that um, bacterial activity is indeed altered in the gut um, and some bacterial activity might be increased to correspond uh, to this increase in gut microbial metabolites such as hippurate in the, in the urine. And also just of note, um, decreased levels of glycine have also been reported in patients with major depressive disorder. What's more is we found that the amount of time spent immobile in the four swim test correlated positively with levels of hippurate uh, in, in urine, further reinforcing the role of altered levels of gut derived metabolites in mediating casein induced increased uh, immobility in the four swim test. Now, one last key finding from my PhD emerged when I tried to pin down which component of casein could be causing these changes to the gut-brain axes. Now, beta casein exists in two forms, A1 and A2 shown here, and only the A1 variant breaks down to release a bioactive peptide called beta casomorphin 7 which not only shows high affinity for um, mu receptors followed by delta opioid receptors, but it's also been implicated in a number of health conditions. Now to tease apart the role of BCM7 in these casein-induced effects, I put mice on either regular commercial milk containing both A1 and A2 variants of milk, or milk containing only the A2 variant, which does not give rise to beta casomorphin 7 and what I found was animals drinking regular commercial milk containing A1 displayed increased depressive, uh, well, increased immobility in the four swim test compared to control, whereas animals who just had um, access to A2 milk did not show a significant increase in ability compared to control. Moreover, metabolomic analysis of urine showed that animals with commercial milk containing the A1 variant of casein presented with decreased abundance of gut microbial metabolite acetate, along with other microbial meta metabolites such as trimethylamine, when compared to animals provided with A2 milk. And this really indicates that A1 beta casein dysregulates circulating gut microbial metabolite profile. For this study, again, with the help of Simona Izufa, we carried out metabolic profiling of the prefrontal cortex, a region of the brain involved in cognition, decision-making and emotional regulation. And strikingly here, we found that um, A2 milk treated animals did not differ from controls. I'm not showing this here. However, animals treated with A1 showed a significant change in a number of metabolites compared to both control and A2 animals. And these findings really reinforce the importance of early life dietary choices on neurobiochemistry. Importantly, what we found was several choline-related metabolites were altered in response to commercial milk containing the A1 uh, beta casein. Uh, and lower amounts of choline, uh, as, as well as um, ethyl, ethanol amine, um, adenyl homocysteine, which is involved in epigenetic regulation, um, as well as higher amounts of um, choline, acetylcholine and phosphocholine, compared to both control animals um, control and A2 treated uh, animals. These findings are important as choline is an important metabolite for several brain functions, uh, including neurotransmission and epigenetic regulation in the form of uh, methylation. And because of these diverse roles, disruptions to this metabolism in early life could have important consequences for brain development and subsequent behavior. Finally, we also used a package called Diablo to integrate um, uh, you know, urinary metabolic findings and brain metabolic findings. And what we found when we did this was that um, metabolites in the urine, such as choline, uh, such as choline-derived trimethylamine, at least shown here, um, correlate with brain uh, levels of um, phosphocholine 
uh, and the, acet the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And together, these findings really highlight the variety of molecules that contribute to communication between the gut and the brain uh, and their potential to be modified by early life uh, environmental factors such as diet or weaning age or what type of milk proteins you're exposed to and how long. Okay, so for a brief interlude here, uh, during the course of my BSc to MSc to desk-based toxicologist to PhD, I was still pursuing fashion and modeling. And here are some images and publications I am proud of during this time, including a magazine front cover at Metropolit Metropolitan Magazine, a campaign with Stella Art Wars and Revlon, um, as well as getting to shoot a fun trailer with Channing Tatum for his West End production of uh, um, Magic Mike. But what, what, you know, the main question in my mind was how are these two careers, you know, complementing each other? And there's several things that I started to notice the longer I kept at both of these careers. And one of the key things was that I was realizing that fashion and modeling could be used very much as communication pieces to convey scientific principles and findings to the wider non-scientific community and learning to distill findings and concepts to audiences without a science background, I would say has greatly um, assisted both my writing abilities, but also speaking abilities uh, and abilities to really summarize findings uh, succinctly. Um, and also I think these uh, two dual careers um, have really opened up doors for innovative and creative collaborations between academia and the arts. And I will mention a few of these towards the end of uh, the talk. So for the final leg of my presentation today, I'd like to highlight some of the research I'm currently conducting into the role of the microbiome and its metabolome in autism spectrum disorders or ASD. I do have several talks coming up on this work, so I won't uh, you know, go into the nitty gritty today, but essentially following in, uh, on from my PhD, uh, as disruptions to the gut microbiome had been linked to neurodevelopmental conditions like ASD, I subsequently developed an interest in gut-brain interactions in autism. And for my postdoctoral research, I decided to join the laboratory of Dr. Drew Karali, MD, PhD, who at the time was at Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and was one of the very few labs looking at microbiome in both addiction and autism. Uh, I was also a huge fan of, of Dr. Karali's translational approach to research. And under his mentorship, I set out to explore gut-brain interactions in a gen genetic mouse model of autism spectrum disorders. And in brief, for those who are unfamiliar with the field, ASD is a very heterogeneous neurodevelopmental condition and is currently characterized by two key features, and those are impairments in um, social interaction and communication and restricted and stereotyped patterns of interest and behavior. We also know that the prevalence of ASD is increasing globally. We know in the US it affects around one in 44 children uh, aged eight years and under, according to the latest CDC uh, publications. And we know that, uh, you know, like many other psychiatric conditions, it has a very complex uh, path pathophysiology, which involves both genetic and environmental components. Now, in terms of genetic components, um, a recent GWAS study um, identified 102 uh, you know, high-risk genes associated with autism. And a lot of these genes were involved in transcriptional regulation, chromatin structure, uh, or neuronal communication and synapse function. And one of these genes is the Shank3 gene highlighted here. Now the Shank3 gene encodes a synaptic scaffolding protein expressed in the postsynaptic density of excitatory glutamatergic neurons and mutations to this gene lead to a condition known as Friedan McDermott syndrome or PMS. And PMS is a severely debilitating condition which often manifests with symptoms of autism um, and is currently one of the leading causes of ASD accounting for somewhere between one to 2% of all cases of autism. So for my uh, postdoctoral studies, we chose to study the microbiome and metabolome in this mouse model created by the SIVA, uh, by a, you know, a, a mouse model of Shank3 created by the SIVA Autism Center by the Buxbaum Lab. So in terms of environmental factors that contribute to ASD, um, as mentioned in my introduction, um, we, there is a growing body of evidence indicating that the gut microbiome is involved in autism. And the, this evidence really comes from both human and animal studies. 
From human studies, we know a large percentage of patients with ASD uh, report with uh, comorbid GI disturbances. And we know that there have been several studies, um, you know, looking at the composition and the complexity of the gut microbiome in ASD and have found differences, although it's, uh, you know, it's very inconsistent. I personally believe we need to take a more nuanced approach to these kind of studies and consider both genetic and environmental factors on the gut microbiome composition. Um, there are also some studies that have shown that autistic patients show altered levels of amino acids and short chain fatty acids. And from animal studies, uh, we know that, you know, early studies in germ-free mice, as well as mice treated with antibiotics early in life, um, result in um, deficits in, in social behavior, changes in gene expression, um, and, you know, generally behavioral uh, domains that resemble ASD-like behaviors. Um, and taken together, such evidence indicates that modulation to the gut microbiome or the metabolome may contribute um, to the development um, of ASD, and we can hopefully target either the, the microbiome or the metabolome to try and improve symptoms of autism. Now, what I focused on for my research is um, these metabolites released when the gut bacteria break down dietary fibers called short chain fatty acids, um, of which there are three main types, acetic acid, propanoic acid, and butyric acid. And we know that these short chain fatty acids not only can enter into circulation, but they've been shown to also enter the brain where they can directly influence uh, chromatin structure and gene expression. And so, um, you know, this is going to be a very quick overview, um, but essentially in this uh, Shank 3 knockout mouse model using 16 s shotgun metagenomics and targeted metagenomics, we were able to show that Shank 3 deficient mice have a reduced gut microbial diversity when assessed by these two key uh, measures. We also found that um, Shank 3 deficient mice, sorry, the key is missing here, but the, the pink is the Shank 3 and blue is wild type. Uh, we see that the knockout mice have a dysregulation of a number of amino acids and um, also dysregulation of two of the eight short chain fatty acids we looked for. Um, of particular interest is this reduction in acetic acid because acetic acid plays you know, several roles, including um, you know, maintenance of the gut wall integrity, as well as epigenetic um, alterations in the brain because it acts as an acetyl donor. And so um, we wanted to see, you know, knowing these baseline dysregulations in the Shank 3 deficient mice, we then wanted to see what would happen if we were to try and mimic an environmental insult against this genetic background. And the environmental insult is in the form of um, dysregulate or further dysregulation to the gut microbiome in the form of antibiotic treatment from weaning age up until postnatal day 60. And so we put these animals on a, a, a well-validated antibiotic uh, mixture, and then again, behaviorally profiled them, looked at the gut microbiome, and then also did some um, uh, metabenomics. But interestingly, what we found um, is that the levels of acetic acid, which were already decreased in knockout animals, were then further decreased following antibiotic treatment. And what we found was that when we looked at the social behavior of these animals using the three chamber social interaction paradigm shown on the right here, we found that wild type animals at baseline spend more time with a mouse versus uh, mouse chamber versus the cup chamber, indicating normal sociability. Uh, whereas knockout animals shown here um, don't show that significant preference for mouse versus cup, indicating a social deficit. When we treat both wild type and knockouts with antibiotics, we see that wild type animals lose their social preference after we reduce the gut microbiome and knockout animals, their social deficit, if anything, becomes further exacerbated and can be, you know, you could argue that it's even a social aversion after you uh, knock down their gut microbiome further. And so what we did was we decided to replenish the depleted levels of acetate in these animals uh, and see if that rescues social deficits or alters molecular, you know, and, and gut microbial profiles of these animals. And so what we did uh, next was we put animals on several uh, drink solutions from postnatal day 21 till postnatal day 60, 
Um, uh, you know, some, some animals got just straight acetate from that period. Other animals got acetate in combination with antibiotics. And this was really to be able to tell if acetate has an effect independent of an intact gut microbiome. And then we repeated our two other uh, water groups and antibiotic groups. And what we found here was that when you treat knockout animals with acetate, their social deficit is now rescued. The N number is low here, but there's more data coming. Um, so, you know, at baseline, they weren't showing this preference for the mouse chamber. And now following six weeks of acetate treatment, they do show this preference. What's more is that if you give animals antibiotics in combination with acetate, acetate is still able to rescue social deficits. Um, and this is also seen in the wild type mice here where you see wild type mice lose social preference due to antibiotic treatment. And then after antibiotic plus acetate treatment, it rescues that social uh, deficit. And so without spending too much time um, on this, we also you know, ran some um, RNA sequencing of the prefrontal cortex to look at gene expression. We did some global metabenomics. I will be discussing all of that data in more detail in other occasions, but quickly looking at the RNA sequencing of the prefrontal cortex. If you look down here at this, uh, this is a weighted gene network analysis. Um, and you see um, along the Y axis here, are the various variables I was looking at in my data set from genotype to sex to treatment to antibiotic treatment or acetate. And you see that acetate treatment really correlates uh, with many of these gene modules shown here. Uh, and we also know that these um, modules uh, correlate significantly with acetate uh, treatment. And so next, you know, I'll, I'll go into these modules and, uh, and see exactly what networks they're in, but this indicates that acetate is able to get into the brain and change the transcriptional profile of the prefrontal cortex and, and might be a mechanism by which it's mediating the social rescue. So in summary, I hope that uh, today I've been able to show you that both genetic and environmental disruptions to the developing microbiome can alter brain and behavior. Sorry for the typo there. Uh, and that disruptions to the development of the microbiome can alter metabolic profile. We also saw that gut-derived metabolites can correlate with behavioral measures um, and that the metabolome can be manipulated or targeted to influence uh, behavior. And for the final slide of my talk today, I wanted to come back and revisit how some of these activities from these parallel careers have been coming together over the last few years. Um, one of the major things that happened recently was obviously the COVID-19 pandemic, and we saw how much misinformation was, um, you know, being passed around during that time, in particular uh, in communities um, of color or marginalized community due to the high distrust uh, in, you know, the scientific system and, and in government. And so what I realized during this time was that there really was a need for science communicators, people who can come out and really explain the science behind COVID and vaccines in a simple manner. And so I partnered up with Dr. Brandon Ogbunu, and we were able to put together a, uh, you know, a perspective article on um, the kind of strategies needed to communicate uh, with marginalized communities you know, during a public health outbreak. I've also been able to um, get to work with this really cool project called the Hip Hop Science Project funded by the Simons Foundation. And the concept behind this project is essentially using the arts, using things like hip hop as a communication piece to reach out to the younger audiences, to reach out to you know, school children and teach them about scientific concepts through hip hop and through music. And so this is really how I envision moving forward that these two, you know, public facing fashion beauty stuff comes in with the science and just allows me to communicate some of our scientific findings to audiences that otherwise we wouldn't necessarily um, reach. With that, I'd like to, uh, there's, you know, we all know in science, you, you, you don't get anywhere without your team and your support. And so I hope I've captured everyone in these acknowledgement slides, but, you know, I'd like to thank my PhD mentoring team and uh, members of my uh, PhD lab. I'd also like to thank um, everyone who supported me so far in my postdoctoral tra training. Um, including Dr. Drew Karali, Eric Nestler, Joseph Buxbaum, uh, Michael Breen, Hala Harani, um, some of the fellow postdocs have helped with the work and graduate students. 
Um, and I'd finally like to thank, um, you know, the funders and the universities that have allowed me to carry out this work so far. And with that, I will stop and we can take uh, questions. That was a great talk, Aya. Um, as you can see, you're getting like applauses here. Celebrating. Can I stop sharing or do you want me? Um, yeah, you can stop sharing. Yeah. Just so I can see you guys. Um, yeah, so I have a question for you. Um, where do you see yourself going next? Like what's next in terms of like, you know, you're doing all of this amazing research and it sounds like you're really interested in science, science communication. So what's up next for you? Yeah, so I think, you know, I think because I kind of took a step out before I started the PhD, I started my PhD a bit later, uh, around 26. I think by this point, I'm pretty sold that I want to stay in academia. Uh, I definitely want to try and go down the path of instructor to assistant professor and so on. Um, I've just, you know, I've tried different jobs and tried different things. And this is really the job that's made me the happiest and allowed me to like, you know, channel most of my um, expertise and skill set. So hopefully it's staying in academia um, and let's see where that goes. But obviously on the side, continue to do science communication and training and storytelling and things like that. That's amazing. Um, do you have any tips for people that, you know, are trying to find a way to combine their like, outside passions with their research? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's it's Jason, basically it's all about balance. Um, I think, you know, when I was moving to the States, my PhD supervisor, you know, he knew how stressful it can be here, but he said to me, you'll be fine because you have other hobbies. And I think that's exactly the right attitude to take with you through science. Um, you know, it's interesting, it's tough. Sometimes the experiments aren't working, results and whatnot. But having something that you enjoy that isn't in science that can, you can do to kind of switch off um, and also maybe, you know, complement your science is definitely a, a way forward. So merging the two um, should come easy if you need a way to like switch off. And if, if anything, it actually improves your science because you're able to step back, take a break, and then revisit it again with a fresh pair of eyes. So highly recommend people having another activity that they do on the side to, to relax a little bit. Amazing. And um, we have a question from the audience. The question is from Julie Pickett. And she's asking, do you have any thoughts on acetate consumption in humans developmentally or during slash after a course of antibiotics, for example? Yeah, I mean, that would be the thought that you combine it as a pre, uh, you know, kind of like a, a, a probiotic even. Uh, and that's kind of a regular approach now from why here when you're prescribed antibiotics, you're also given some probiotics to kind of help counteract. There is literature in terms of acetate uh, replenishment in both preclinical and clinical models. Uh, in general, it is believed to have beneficial health effects. Um, mm -hmm. The reason I say that carefully is there is also some literature from the cancer field that um, acetate can kind of play a role in the propagation of um, you know, cell division and replication cycles. So um, mm. until we've kind of looked at it more carefully and kind of looked at any off-target effects other than its beneficial effects, um, treat it with caution uh, currently. But yes, there is a body of literature and I'm happy to send anyone any papers if they're interested on acetate replenishment in humans. Okay, great. Are there any last, last minute questions from the audience? Okay, well, oh, actually there is another question. Um, for genetic network analysis, how do you go from finding, how, how, sorry, how do you go about finding implications in human models? So is that, sorry, is that from like the GWAS studies? Um, yeah, I, I would say so, yes. Uh, so GWAS studies are usually, are usually um, based on human data. Um, so they're more directly applicable to what's going on in the human population. But then based on those findings, what you find from these GWAS studies is that actually each gene 
really accounts for a really small effect size. Um, so ASD, like I said, it was like one to two percent. But still, when you have a number of these genetic findings from large GWAS studies in humans, you can then take them into the lab and, and knock out those genes in mouse models. And then that allows us to study what the molecular uh, perturbations that happen when this gene is mutated in an animal model and then hopefully can you know translate that back into humans and that's kind of what we've done with my autism work it came you know we picked out the shank 3 gene from a GWAS study phenotyped it in the lab um, and now where I'm trying to access human data from patients carrying that mutation to see if there's an overlap between what I'm finding in the lab and, and um, in the human condition does that answer your question I feel like it was a roundabout <laughs> answer to it they said, yes, it did. Um, we have another question, um, kind of going off of what you were just saying about, you know, translating um, your work. So um, Whitney is asking, what are your next approaches or studies that you want to do with your mouse models? Um, I think they're asking about your autism work. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. I, I think the main thing that comes to my mind, first of all, is I really want to do a deeper behavioral phenotyping of the social behavior. The three chamber was great, but I'd like to show that it's reversing sociability in other ways. But secondly, I really wanted to try and get into um, a way that we can trace these metabolites from the periphery into the brain. And there's some really great work being done by the likes of Ian Mays and others where you can chemically tag these metabolites and then see um, if they're getting into the brain. I do have metabolomic data showing it's in circulation assay, and then I have the RNA sequencing data showing expression, gene expression changes. But yes, uh, a direct evidence that is getting into the brain would be, and you know, even maybe binding to chromatin and whatnot would be um, a, a good step forward. And I hope that I can carry that out. That experiment sounds really cool. I'm excited. Yeah. To Ashley, coming. maybe you might need to talk. <laughs> yeah, we can collaborate. Happy to. Yeah. And then um, we have one more question. Um, an anonymous attendee uh, said, um, I appreciate your efforts in science communication. I was wondering how do you network these opportunities? Um, how does one get started? Is, there, is this something your mentor had to approve? If anything, no, I think probably Drew at first was like, what are you doing? <laughs> but um, I tried really hard not to let it affect my day-to-day -day work. And I kind of, you know, took the burden on myself on weekends and whatnot. Um, but honestly, mainly, first of all, I did get a lot of contacts, obviously, from the fashion and modeling industry, you know, magazines and whatnot, who just wanted to hear about the science. But outside of that, honestly, I would say it was probably my social media pages that did it. I was just consistent in distilling information, changing it into posts, making stories. You know, you know, people might see it as kind of blowing your own horn, but I really amplified any work that I was doing. And that captured the attention of certain individuals who were in that field, you know, from the likes of Paula Croxon and Story Collider and um, Science Sandbox from the Simons Foundation. And so I would just really say, put in the work and put it out there and then it picks up the attention um, of the right people. And yeah, happy to connect with people too if they, if, you know, if there's events and so, so on, I can uh, let you know and then you can come and, and network that way. That's really good advice. I feel like nowadays, social media is becoming this like more than just like a way to, you know, like communicate with your friends and like update people on what you're doing. It's a great way to network and, you know, like establish like kind of like a brand and like who you are. So that's. Yeah, really exactly. It's a, it can be a double-edged sword, but I think it has a lot of benefits. Um, you know, I don't want to turn social media into work. So I do try to have my own, you know, private outlets, but um yeah, it's a tool that needs to be utilized more for these kind of purposes. Absolutely. Okay, well, I think those are all of our questions. Thank you so much, Aya, for being here. Thank you, guys. Um, it was a great talk, um, and we hope to hear more about your research soon. For sure. Thank you again, and thank you for the organizers. Like I said, this is a wonderful platform and community, and just, yeah, thank you for continuing.